Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everybody for attending this event on human rights and Sharia law. Um, in addition to the topics in the report of Mr. Antonio Guterres, I will inform you about other painful realities in the lives of millions of European Muslim women. I am the director of Fund for Freedom, and we have a very simple message. The many Muslim women in Europe are European citizens and have the same basic human rights as other European citizens. But we do not get those rights and therefore cannot participate fully in European society. In our case, it is not the government that oppresses us, but our communities. However, governments have a responsibility to uphold human rights for all citizens. Important steps have, have been taken, for example, in the Netherlands, where marital captivity has become a criminal offense. But unfortunately, European governments still are afraid to address human rights issues in the Muslim communities. And therefore, um, and there is even a school of thought that argues that if the Muslim community wants to deal with family issues through Sharia law and establish Sharia courts, that should be allowed. And in my opinion, this is very wrong. The European countries all have good legal systems that are the basis for the human rights of all the citizens. Do not allow these systems to be undermined by separate systems. Such separate systems are a continuation of oppression of women and in many cases also of men. We are all European citizens, we have the right to enjoy and have the same human rights as all other European citizens. Let me start with the issue of marital captivity. This is a situation in which Muslim women are unable to terminate their Islamic marriage because divorce is the exclusive right of a man. In a situation of marital captivity, a civil court may have dissolved the civil marriage, but the Islamic marriage still continues. As long as a woman is tied to her Islamic marriage, she may become socially excluded in the best case scenario. She is unable to remarry or start a new relationship and start a new family. So her fundamental human rights are violated. But if she does enter a new relationship, according to civil law, she could be prosecuted for adultery or bigamy in Muslim countries, because this is what Sharia law rules. But marital captivity is not a new phenomenon. For example, it also existed until 1971 in the Netherlands. Until 1971, couples couldn't divorce without accusing the other of adultery. And this was not often an option because adultery was a criminal act in the Netherlands. After many letters of male and female victims of marital captivity, the Dutch government and parliament um, started to reform the, the, the Dutch family law. Um, we had gender equality and self-determination. Um, an irretrievable breakdown was recognized in our family law. And finally, adultery was not a crime anymore. But that was then, and now we live in 2019, in a new era. Europe has changed after the 70s. Europe has not only become a multicultural, a multi-ethnic society, but also a multi-legal society. And I am one of those many descendants of Muslim migrants, and therefore experience myself how Sharia law influenced my life, even though I am a Dutch citizen living in the Netherlands. Let me tell you about my case. Uh, in 1971, I came to the Netherlands with my parents from Pakistan when I was a six-month-year-old baby. When I was young, I wanted to become a judge or join the Dutch Foreign Service. But I became an activist to combat marital captivity and all other forms of injustice in the name of religion and culture. I saw the injustice and inequality happening into women of my own community. Women who suffered from polygamous marriages, women who were stuck in marital captivity for the rest of their lives, and young women and girls, my best friends, who were married when they were 14, 15, and 16. Even some women were killed because they had a boyfriend. But I was lucky. I completed my high school education and went to university. I entered my marriage voluntarily and could never imagine that I would end up in marital captivity. After my civil divorce, my ex-husband refused me an Islamic divorce. My life felt stuck. I felt a lot of physical pain. I was living in fear and worries. I couldn't remarry or start a new relationship because otherwise I could face prosecution for adultery in my country of origin, Pakistan. My ex-husband wanted me to become one of his two wives. 
because Sharia law, law allows men to marry four women and all women have to submit themselves to the marital obedience rule. And this means that the wife has to obey the husband in everything he wants. If he forces me to drink a glass of water, I have to listen to him. If he forces me to have intimacy with him, I have to follow him. Well, I ask all religious authorities, including the Grand Ayatollah al-Sistani in Iraq, Dutch lawyers and professors for help, and nobody could help me, but I started to study law. I wanted to make an end to my situation, and I discovered that um, Dutch jurisprudence uh, rules that a Jewish lady, she managed to get rid of her um, Jewish situation of marital activ activity, um, and the Dutch Supreme Court in 1982 ruled that the Jewish situation of marital captivity was a wrongful act. So I went to the secular courts, the civil courts, and I started um, a civil case against my ex-husband. And I used the Dutch wrongful act article and for the very first time the European Convention on Human Rights, article 8 and 12. I said I couldn't remarry and I couldn't establish a new family life. The judge ordered my ex-husband to pay penalties for each day he refused to give me a religious divorce. And with the recognition of marital captivity as human rights violation and a wrongful act in civil law, it became a precedent for many other women in the Netherlands. And I decided to establish Fuck for Freedom for making life easier for women and girls who are stuck in different legal systems. But my case was quite easy and I was loved and supported by my parents and I found my way in Dutch law. I made a situation, I made an end to my situation and now I live a happy life in peace and dignity. But you might think that this lady is free like a bird, but I am not. This lady who is talking to you now is still not having the same rights like you because of Sharia law. I can never marry a non-Muslim for example. If I do, I will be convicted for 20 years in Pakistan. If I have a relationship out of wedlock, I will, pro I will be prosecuted for adultery in Muslim countries and may face re retributions for my community in the Netherlands. I and many others don't have a choice to get rid of Sharia. If I leave Islam, then I will face trouble again. But still, I consider myself fortunate, but many women are not. The lady um, after me will tell you how she was prosecuted for adultery. And I'm talking about a European citizen born and raised here in a Western European country. But let me give you another example, a very complex example of a girl with a Muslim background who can be confronted with transnational violence and Sharia law. For example, a 13-year-old girl, um, a Dutch girl who was born and raised here, brought to Sudan and forced into a marriage because Sudanese Sharia law allows girls to marry, minor girls. Um, let's suppose if she wants to return back to the Netherlands and she asks the Dutch embassy for help, again, um, they cannot help her with a passport because then the Dutch passport rule, uh, the, the Dutch passport law says that you need the permission of your parents. And back when we go to Sharia law, you need the permission of your husband. So these are, I mean, real, case, I mean, real life stories um, that we are stuck um, in no man's land. If the girl comes back to the Netherlands, she cannot get rid of her Sudanese marriage because her marriage is established in Sudan. And I will also give you another example of our slavery and misery, because it feels like slavery and misery, of many European Muslim women who suffer from the male guardianship. I mean, it's not only a Saudi issue, but if an Iranian woman, an Egyptian woman, or a Saudi woman, born and raised here, if she ever goes back to her country of origin, they cannot leave the country because they need the permission of the male guardian. So, um, well, what should I say? I mean, I am. Um, I mean, we can never win from Sharia law for, of our native countries, and also not uh, from the rules of international nationality law. But I am very disappointed in European uh, politicians. In European politicians who always give a firm stand for women in Arab countries when their uh, human rights are violated, but whenever our own women face the same uh, issues, they remain silent. Europe supports women's rights, gender equality, and female leadership <coughs> in Africa, in Asia, in Arab countries with development aid and programs like She Decides. Um, but back here, I mean, we face the same problems. But only, um, I mean, people always talk with scientists, academics, and Muslim men. 
It hurts, angers and disappoints me to be a third class citizen and it disappoints me that in 2019, in my country, the Netherlands, Salafi mosques, they even uh, preach that female genital mutilation is recommended according to Sharia in Islam. And that, is, and, and that there is zero action taken because this is so-called so, uh, so called the freedom of religion. And then our dignity, health, peace and safety is sacrificed for the fear of being considered as a racist and Islamophobe instead of the courage to protect us. And my personal opinion, who am I, is that it is an act of racism and discrimination if you keep if you keep ignoring us and not taking any action to stand up against the injustice we live in. So Muslim girls are in no man's land when it comes to the enforcement of, our, of, of their internationally recognized human rights. Muslim women who get married in their country of origin and later want a divorce can face horrible issues due to the clashing legal systems because Muslim countries do not recognize European divorce verdicts as well the Sharia is not applied except Turkey and Tunisia. The situation is complicated because religious and legal systems also affect issues of marriage and divorce in Muslim communities back here. So to help European Muslim women and girls exercise their internationally human rights, we need to build international coalitions between governments, legal organizations, human rights defenders and stakeholders. We can only tackle issues like this successfully if we exchange ideas, views, initiatives, uh, do research and work together. And women's rights in today's multicultural world with different national and religious legal systems influencing the lives of individual women need creative solutions and courage that can be applied beyond national borders. After the Second World War, an international human rights architecture was developed. What started with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was soon elaborated into treaties. The optimism of 1948, a broad agreement um, on international human rights has not materialized because international political developments have often gone in a different direction. But the way human rights have been laid down in binding international public law with national and in some cases international courts enforcing them is beyond <coughs> expectations. Individuals who could not make themselves heard can now go to court and raise the issues of the violation of their human <coughs> rights. <coughs> a, last, a few last. <laughs> but this, this has been the first step. Um, isn't this a time to start looking for a second step by bringing international private law and nationality law in line with the internationally recognized human rights? Should we not take steps to enforce women's rights by introducing the necessary rights into international private law, especially regarding marriage, divorce and self-determination? And this is a complicated discussion, I agree both within the women's rights or movements and within government and other legal organizations, <coughs> people are cautious. Women's rights organizations think the struggle should be made in the international political arena. Governments and legal organizations are afraid that a bold approach to international private law will endanger the progress made in the past 50 years. But I have a different vision. I see international private law as a vehicle to make change possible, for which the international political arena alone is not ready yet for bringing the subject to the international legal agenda, like today. Slow but unexpected changes may appear possible, which will then also affect the international political agenda. agenda. And we need to build coalition, coalitions to set up a system of cooperating legal um, and human rights organizations which can feed government organizations with ideas regarding international private law development and the value of this for the coming generations of girls and women cannot be overestimated. But let's make a first important step. I hope you will vote for the resolutions of Mr. Peter Omzicht and the resolution for a broader definition of forced marriage with the force to continue a marriage. All kinds of forms of violence against women have been recognized in treaties and resolutions, but not marital captivity, even not in the Istanbul Convention. And I beg you, talk with us not about us. You, native Europeans, fought in the 1970s for legal equality between men and women, for sexual and reproductive rights. You achieved impressive results, but we are not there yet. Now it's our turn to continue the fight. We are European citizens and we need your assistance and recognition of the injustice that we suffer in the name of Sharia and culture and support our fight for sexual and reproductive rights, for gender equality, um, for the Muslim women. 
Our fight is not only important for Muslim women, it is also a necessary step for the emancipation of the entire Muslim community. I do not think that all Muslim men are bad. Many young men are open for change, but they also suffer from pressure from, pressure from the current male leaders in their communities. And Islam can, all, can, can, of course, go hand in hand with the European Convention on Human Rights. No problem. But we have to end the rule of the patriarchy in our communities. And if Europe helps us to achieve our fundamental human rights, this will help the emancipation and integration of our communities. And only then, and only when women and men from our communities will be able to participate and contribute fully to the European society. And I want to thank you for listening to me. And thank you very much, Mr. Omzit, for your patience. If you have questions <laughs> or need further information, um, I mean, I will be uh, at your disposal at any time. Thank you.